Welcome back. Recent changes to the Ontario sex ed curriculum have been applauded by some and opposed by others. Let's explore the Islamic perspective on sex education. How was sex ed dealt with historically? What concepts are important to teach children and why? Joining me to help answer some of these questions is Farah Marfatia, principal of Main Gate Islamic Academy. Farah is also developing two key documents to help Muslim parents and educators understand sex ed. Before we begin, please note that we will be discussing mature themes. Parental guidance is advised. Welcome to the show, Farah. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. We're, we're really excited to have you on as well. Um, so let's get started. Can you tell me, is there such a thing as Islamic sexual education to begin with? Yeah, totally, right? Like if you look at the books of fiqh, they're f filled with it, right? If you look at the questions that um, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked, mm -hmm. you see that he was asked questions even by women, right? So a woman, for example, approached the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, um, you know, if I have a wet dream, do I have to perform ghusl? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said yes. And can you just define for non-Muslim viewers when you say ghusl, what is that? Um, so ghusl would mean um, t bathing yourself okay. um, afterwards. Okay, so these are general, I mean, the topic of sexual education is something that we know historically has been something that's been discussed and taught. Absolutely, right? And even when you read the Quran um, and you're reading the surahs of the Quran, uh, you see that, um, you know, Allah has described uh, you know, relationships between men and women in marriage, um, you know, procreation, uh, etc. So absolutely, I think that there is such a thing as uh, Islamic sex education. Perfect. So from your perspective, what do you, what are some of the topics that you think kids need to know uh, and at what ages? And we know that the revised curriculum just came out and one of the biggest criticisms it's receiving is this whole notion and sense of age appropriateness. So I guess from your perspective, um, what are some of those topics that you think need to be taught? So. I think that when this curriculum comes out, age appropriateness kind of goes out the window, right? So we have to remember that 80% of our Muslim kids are in public schools. So we need to start talking about to our kids about everything that is going to come up in the curriculum, period, right? Um, so we can approach this from an Islamic perspective. What do we think Islamically is age appropriate? Or what do we think is age appropriate now, mm -hmm. right? And given the curriculum, I think that Every parent should look at, for example, grade one, right? Don't look at the whole document, it's huge, right? You wanna look at the grade one section, you wanna look at what they're gonna be talking about, so they're gonna be talking about private parts. So then you wanna talk to your kids about private parts. Um, and you know they're gonna be teaching the real words, so penis, vagina, and those are not like, Common terms yeah, that, that you use, like throw yeah. around, right? <laughs> yes. Um, but what, what I uh, would tell parents whose children are learning these terms in school is when you're, uh, first of all, tell your child beforehand what they're going to be learning in school, teach them the terms themselves, and then say to them this, that these terms are serious terms. So using the word penis, using the ver word vagina, those are serious things. Those are names for your private parts. You should be using them in only two, for only two reasons. One, if you get hurt there, or if someone hurts you there, or if someone touches you there, that's not your mom and dad. You know, and other than that, any other time you happen to want to throw around this word, honey, Use Not private part, yes. well, or use <laughs> private part. <laughs> Definitely. Right? Um, from an Islamic perspective, it's interesting. So a lot of people think that teaching um, terminology at grade one, this terminology at grade one, uh, is not appropriate, but if you look at it from an Islamic perspective, there's nothing in Islam that says you can't teach it. Mm -hmm. Okay? There's nothing in Islam that says you should, but there's nothing in Islam that says you can't. Right? So I just want people to uh, bear that in mind. Uh, with the new curriculum, I think that it's imperative that parents teach their kids before the teacher teaches them. I know they, they teach a couple of topics, puberty, reproduction, homosexuality, gender identity, um, and also consent and sexual activity. Now, my question for you is when, it, so you said we should approach all of these topics. Yeah. My question about consent and sexual activity, um, now is this a topic that's necessary to teach and given the, and the, the reason I ask this is because Islam is an abstinence-based religion. So the other question you might get is, is this a topic that's even necessary for us to teach our Muslim kids? So what do you say to that? Okay, that is a very interesting question. And the reason why is because, what is abstinence? Abstinence is um, basically saying, I'm gonna not have sex before marriage. Um, so we're going to teach our kids don't have sex before marriage, but have we t taught our kids how to say no? I how do you say no? So you're going to tell your kid, okay, don't have sex before marriage, and your, your child's going to be like, okay, mom, okay, dad. 
then they're going to go to school and they're going to get into a situation because you're not there. They're going to be at a party or they're going to be like, you know, with other kids, even in a school environment, right? And someone may be pressuring them to do something or whatever. Have you taught your child how to say no? No, you haven't. So consent is agreeing to do something or not do something. In my mind, consent basically means if you teach your child consent as a Muslim, you should teach them how to say no. Right? Irrespective just, of the circumstance. That's right, right? And, and if you equip them with the tools of how to say no, uh, then basically you've just not only taught them about abstinence in Islam, but you've taught them how to say no in pressure situations. Not, not just the what, but the how as well. And I know you were working uh, on a particular document to help parents uh, discuss this topic called Parent Talk. So maybe we can get a little bit on that. But um, prior to that, I just want to touch again further to your point about uh, you know this whole notion of learning to say no. Um, I know you said you've gathered some statistics from Nasiha. And unfortunately, the issue of sexual activity in that whole range is prevalent in the Muslim community, right? And that's yeah. something that we need to address. Absolutely. So um, if you look at, um, well, even pornography, masturbation. Um, so Nasiha is the Muslim helpline. Um, but even before Nasiha, there was a very interesting um, PhD publication that came out out of the University of Windsor. Um, I think Sobia Faisal Ali uh, was um, Dr. Sobia Faisal Ali, I suppose, right now. She did a, a study uh, or a survey across uh, Canada and in, in the United States in Muslims. Um, and basically what she found that two-thirds of Muslims who had had sex ever, whether that be before marriage or after, well, two-thirds of the Muslims who had had sex had had sex before marriage. Okay. Okay? And 50% of those who had not um, had thought about it. Right? So it is something that's happening in our community. Right? Um, so that's one part of it. The other thing is when you look at the Nasiha statistics, you see that um, in children ages 11 to uh, 14 um, in 2013, 100% of the calls that came into Nasiha were regarding pornography and masturbation. 100%? 100% in boys, actually. 100% pornography and masturbation. How does this fare against what's actually going on in the North American community? So when you look at, when you look at it in North America, you see that 9 out of 10 children have um, you know, viewed some type of pornography on the Internet. You know? so, you know, our, our society is becoming increasingly sexualized, right? And that's what's driving our kids to, you know, have urges, right? And then not know how to contain these urges and then, um, you know, engage in behavior that's not abstinence. Yeah. So tell me a little bit, I know with uh, the document that you're working on, you're working on a document right now called Parent Talk. Tell me a little bit about how that document is helping parents have these conversations. Uh, so uh, the Parent Talk document, um, it's not a very long document, um, but it's broken down by grade and it's till for elementary and junior school only. There's nothing for high school. So Jake, uh, grade one to grade eight. Um, and it's broken down by grade for parents. So what it does is it gives a very, very brief summary of the curriculum, just so you know like the bullet points of what are, what's being taught, and then um, maybe a one-pager of how parents can approach these topics with their children from an Islamic perspective. And it's, it's very loose. It's not very um, specific. Um, but it's enough to get you started with a conversation with your child. And I really like, I know I had a chance to review the document, that w even within the context of how you have that conversation with children, I think you've worked with um, some leaders in the community to make sure there's also, you know, reference to sort of how this was dealt with in the, prof in the Prophet's time and what the Quran says about some of these concepts. Yes. So um, I'm working with members of the Imam Council, um, and they've helped me kind of look at it from a religious point of view as well. Um, and a, a, the document everybody has to understand, however, is not a document where we say from a religious perspective, in grade one you should talk about this, in grade two you should talk about this, in grade three you should talk about mm -hmm. this. Because I have a very different viewpoint if asked from an Islamic point of view when I would teach these things. Okay? But given our current circumstance, given our current situation, we are responding to that. Right? And so um, that's where that comes from. And uh, the members of the Imam Council have been instrumental in helping me create that document. Um, and I understand you're also working on another document. Um, as a, so tell me a little bit about that, because I know, obviously, as a principal of Main Gate Islamic Community, you're looking at um, the sexual health curriculum. So tell us a little bit about that document as well. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, from an Islamic school point of view, we're a private school. So we don't actually have to follow any ministry curriculum. 
Uh, and however, in this particular case, the health education curriculum, um, I looked at the health education curriculum, and you know the kids that come to my school? Um, they have cousins in public school. They okay. have friends in public school. They have older siblings in public school. So for me, as an Islamic school principal, even though I don't have to teach this curriculum, I have to understand what this curriculum is about so I can understand how I'm going to approach it at my school, given that there's cross-talk, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's an it's ebb and flow, right? Yeah. So what I did was um, I looked at the ministry curriculum um, and its expectations in more details, and I did a side-by-side -side co com comparison and um, I actually created um, expectations from an Islamic perspective as well. And this is a document now, um, not for parents, although parents can access it and use it if they choose to, but more for Islamic schools, should they choose to use it, um, more for masajids, if they want to kind of address what's going out uh, or what's going on in terms of the curriculum in the public school system. And when are both of these documents going to be publicly released so people can access it? Yeah, so it's actually completely done. It's um, even been uh, like it just needs to be fine-tuned and it's gone for its last look-see to the imams that are helping me work on this. Perfect. And once they give it their stamp of approval, then we're going to release it. Not sure on what forum yet, but it'll be a forum hopefully that has the most reach. I know we talked about um, you know some of these topics in general, but I want to I want to get your perspective on some of the topics that are causing a lot of um, stir within the community. Um, so, how do you approach the discussion of masturbation? Is <gasps> that something that's <laughs> you said the word masturbation? Is that something that's in the in the curriculum? And I know that's creating a lot of conversation. So, I was wondering if you could give your insight on that. Sure. Um, so, masturbation is actually not um, uh, expectation in the curriculum. So, the curriculum has two things in it. It's the expectations teachers must teach. And then teacher prompts. Teachers can uh, teach if there's a question in the classroom. So the expectation, just to be clear, so the expectation is what's mandatory and Absolutely. the teacher prompts are, are up to the discretion of the teacher whether they want to use it or not. Yes, exactly. Okay. So masturbation is covered as a teacher prompt. So in the event that there's a question in the classroom, then the teacher will answer a question about masturbation. Um, so the perspective from an Islamic point of view in terms of masturbation, if your child has a question about anything, uh, masturbation, I mean any wild thing, I would never suggest lying to your child about it. I would say that you should have an open discussion about it with them from an Islamic point of view. From an Islamic point of view, masturbation is not something that's permissible within Islam, but there is differences of opinion on, on this particular topic. Uh, so for example, um, some ulama say, or some uh, religious leaders say that um, that masturbation is not permissible. Other religious leaders say that if masturbation is what's going to keep you um, from engaging in sexual activity before marriage, then in that event it may be permissible in moderation. So the lesser of two evils. That's right. Alternatively, if you do have an urge, um, there is a hadith of the Prophet to kind of curb that sexual appetite to fast. Okay, so these are things that are covered in the Parent Talk document, also in the Islamic um, curriculum that um, you know we're putting together. Um, so that's what I think from an Islamic point of view regarding masturbation. I think that's very helpful. Um, okay, what about oral and anal sex? Yeah, you're just the gloves are off <laughs> I just today, gotta, right? Gotta ask all yeah, of them. Yeah, 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 all of them. Okay, so oral and anal sex. Remember the expectation versus the teacher prompt. Yes. Again, oral and anal sex come in as part of a teacher prompt. And I've been hearing um, things in the in the community that they're going to be teaching what oral sex is and what anal sex is. Um, really, the way they're going to be teaching oral and anal sex is they're not going to be teaching it at all unless someone in the classroom asks a question. Okay, so it's not even part of the expectation. No, it's not. It's not part of the expectations. It's a, it's a teacher prompt um, and they will teach it as it relates to s sexually transmitted diseases so I think people have to understand a little bit of the background of why this even made it into the curriculum it made it into the curriculum because they realized that the the government I'm just going to use this term very loosely here realized that the pregnancy rates were dropping and so you think people were having less sex or safer sex right yes well, what ended up happening was that they noticed that there was an increase in sexually transmitted diseases or sexually transmitted infections, STDs, STIs. So they're like, hey, what's happening here? And what they noticed is that kids, students, they don't have money for contraceptives. 
they were engaging in alternate forms of sexual activity, such as oral and anal sex, to prevent pregnancy, which was re uh, leading to a, a lower pregnancy rate, but a spike in STDs. Mm -hmm. And that's why it made its way into the curriculum. From an Islamic perspective, this is, this is one place where I just, I, I cringed when I saw oral and anal sex because in Islam, you know, one, it's one thing. Look, you have to teach your kids abstain from sex, don't have sex before marriage. And then, so that covers the oral and anal sex part of it if they learn it. But now, you know what, you have to go one step further as a parent. You have to say, by the way, when you get married and it is halal and lawful for you to engage in sexual activity, by the way, anal sex is completely prohibited in Islam. You cannot have anal sex, you know? And so you have to go that one step further. And I guess the right age is, I mean, leave it up to each parent. And I guess if your child asks you for it, uh, about it, sorry, then. Absolutely. Like, if they're going to teach it in the curriculum, again, that age appropriateness, you got to ask, like, it's like that, that argument is gone. Yeah. Unfortunately. Okay, the final one, gender identity. Gender identity, <laughs> also a hot topic. So you know what I really want to communicate? I want to communicate that as Muslims, we don't hate anyone, okay? We're not homophobic. Um, we have to be just, okay? And um, you know, there's a hadith of the Prophet um, which says that um, Muslims are those people um, from whose tongues others are safe. Okay, and so we have to kind of listen to that, hear that, and, and, and you know, follow that. So what I would say is that in terms of gender identity, to explain gender identity to your child, because at grade one children are learning two moms and two dads, so you're gonna have to explain that to your child. And that's an expectation? That's an expectation. Okay. And that's an expectation that you cannot opt out of because it's against the Ontario Human Rights Code. Okay, so even if you opt out of the sex ed curriculum, you cannot opt out of the two moms and two dads conversations. You will Im have to have this conversation with your children. By the way, it's already happening in schools. Don't wait for the curriculum. Ask your child. They already know about it. They started this back when Bill 13 came out, just creating safe and accepting schools. So the way you would want to talk to them is, you know, Allah created, what were the first two creations of Allah, right? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Why? For creation? For creation. Yeah. We needed to populate the earth, right? So a mom marries a dad so that we can have children, right? And a mom and dad can get married, right? Now we live in this community and we live in this society, right? Um, and so we have different values and ideals than other people may. So you might see that there's a child who has two moms and there's a child that has two dads. Um, and that's, you know, that's their values, that's their belief. What they do in their private life is none of our business. Just like what we do in our private life is none of anybody else's business, right? What mama and daddy do and what their two moms do is none of our business, right? But we don't hate anyone, you know? And you know the behavior, the, the urge? The urge is something that exists, okay? It even exists in Muslims. So if you look back at the Nasiha data that I was talking about, um, in um, adults 31 and over, 13% of Muslim adults who called in, 20, in 2013 to Nasiha had questions about their sexual orientation. You know, so this is, the urge exists, and it has existed since the time of Lut, right? Um, so it's not the urge um, that we have a pro like there, that there's a problem with. It's just that we don't engage in the behavior, right? Um, we don't engage in the act, right? And that's something for, I guess, at the higher levels if you want to teach your kids. But at the lower level, you can just create it. You can just talk about Adam Keep and Eve. Keep it simple. Keep yeah. it simple, you know? It's a very complex topic, you know? And I suggest parents really look into it, learn about it themselves, and then pick a very gentle way of talking to their kids about it. This was very helpful. Thank you so much, Farah. Yeah, no problem. Thank you.